Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. This is Just Don't Buy It, Consumer Choices and Free Activism. My name is John Sullivan. I'm the Executive Director at the Free Software Foundation. Uh, I've been with the foundation since 2003. Uh, didn't become Executive Director until 2011. I had a number of different positions with the foundation over the years, and I think most relevant for this talk is that I was the FSF's first campaigns manager. Uh, which was a position that was created um, in order when the FSF decided that we wanted to do more in the area of uh, public activism uh, focused on the general public, whereas you know, historically the FSF grew out of a strong base of hackers and people actually working on and sharing code. So uh, I've been with the FSF's campaign efforts for you know, most of the time that they've existed. And they've all been geared towards our general mission, which is that we want all of the software that everybody uses on any computer to be free software. So that's not just most of the software. It's not all software except the software that you carry in your pocket. It's all software should be free software. And this talk, uh, my main goals here are I want to share some stories about FSF campaigns and show some pictures. Um, I have some interesting things to share about them. Uh, hopefully, we'll provide some tools for your advocacy kit as a free software advocate. That's one of the great things I love about coming to this conference um, is getting to meet a lot of you who are doing uh, real advocacy for free software at your workplaces, you know, in your social networks, schools, uh, and that's really important. And a lot of the talks that I do tend to focus on how can we as a movement and as, as advocates develop our approaches to be more effective at those things. And that's much more closely related to my personal background because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not, uh, I'm not a programmer, I run my own servers, but I do kind of a bad job at it. So my background is actually in poetry and philosophy. And so that's why I come to this from uh, you know, an ethical perspective, really caring about the philosophy behind all of it, less so for my own interest in being able to mod modify code that I use and more so in the interest of believing that's the right uh, structure of society and the way that code should be produced. And I'm also kind of obsessed with language, it's the poetry thing, so uh, I like to, to work on improving the ways that we talk about things to try to have our advocacy be more effective. I want to point to just a few ways that you can help. There's some FSF projects that you can get involved with. Um, and I also want to learn from you. I'm going to try really hard to finish with enough time to have some conversation at the end of this. Uh, you'll see it be pretty evident that this talk is uh, it's new, and I'm really just starting to do more research in this area. A uh, goal of working on this talk for me was to get deeper in that, to look at other social movements and campaigns in other areas, and uh, try to learn from them to improve our strategies at the FSF. I know a lot of you probably have experience with uh, advocacy outside of free software and other areas of social change as well. And uh, I'd really like to hear about it. You know, we really want to make free software uh, an issue for the general public. Like to describe it as making free software ethics a kitchen table issue, or maybe a couch in front of the TV issue, if that's where you eat your meals. But something that you know, regular people talk about on a regular basis, along with all the other political issues of the day. And you know, with all the things that are happening and the relevance of technology in all of our lives, there's no reason you know, that should be achievable. That's something that people actually do need to be talking about and uh, understanding better. One note about what this talk isn't, uh, academic, this is largely based on um, anic data and you know, 10,000 foot surveys of uh, reading about uh, different consumer activist approaches. So for me, it's a start. I plan to do more better and deeper research in this area, by which I mainly mean reading more of the literature that's already out there. I'm definitely interested in any recommendations or pointers from you all about uh, books or um, sources that have impacted your thinking on these issues. So the title of this talk and kind of the genesis, genesis of it, you know, if you don't like it, just don't buy it, uh, came from something I've heard a lot from people over the years who aren't fully on board with some of the things that we've been doing at the FSF. Uh, in particular, people who have not been on board with the campaigns that we've run against non-free software. So the FSF does do a lot of things to support the production of free software and to make free software better. 
but we also view proprietary software as, as fundamentally unethical, and so we campaign against proprietary software as well as for free software. And I've had a, a lot of people tell me, you know, if, you, if you don't like Apple, if you don't like iPhones, just don't buy them. Like, why are you protesting? Why are you out on the street outside the Apple store with a sign? Uh, why are you trying to tell other people what to do? And I think there's a lot of interesting assumptions in that retort that need to be unpacked. This idea, you know, the biggest one being that uh, if a company wants to produce something and somebody wants to buy it, it's inherently a valid option that people should be able to choose you know, if they desire it. But it's also kind of an oddly uh, isolating approach. You know, if we don't buy things and don't tell people about them, about the fact that we're not buying them, how's that ever going to cause any kind of change? So that's what led me down this path. Um, and when I talk about consumer activism, I'm going to focus on just three broad categories, uh, boycotts, certifications, and buying guides. Uh, these things are all, you know, people call this also, it's consumer activism, they call it moral purchasing, they call it ethical consumerism. Uh, these are pretty intuitive ideas for people, that, you know, boycotts, uh, if you punish a company by not buying their product, then eventually they'll have to change, right, because they're a company, they have to make money or certifications that uh, put positive marks on products that say that you should buy them for different reasons. Well, that you know, helps create businesses. That's, and buying guides, you know, telling you to buy certain products, not other products. Uh, those things appeal to the fact that we have money, we can spend it, and that's a form of power. And so I think that's why these ideas are one of the main you know, first go-tos for any sort of activist or, or social change movement. Um, but one of the questions we're going to ask in this talk is you know, how much of our activism should be funneled in these, through these tools? You know, do we, are there dangers in relying on them too much? So I'm going to start with boycotts. Uh, I didn't know this before starting this talk, but uh, the word boycott comes from a man named Boycott. Uh, involved in a dispute with some uh, tenant farmers in Ireland. Uh, he tried to evict tenants from the land who were refusing uh, uh, a rent increase. And uh, Boycott himself was soon isolated um, in protest of that, not just from those farmers, but also from other people. The post office stopped delivering to him. Uh, and you know, other people basically in the community shunned him. So that's where the term Boycott comes from. I just uh, went through, you know, think of boycotts, what are the first ones that came to my mind? Uh, Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks. Uh, North Carolina, the state where I currently live, uh, faced uh, quite a bit of boycott pressure over the last few years over the HB2 bathroom bill uh, that uh, told people that they had to use the bathroom that corresponded to the, their gender at birth or their sex at birth. NFL, uh, there's been a lot of people encouraging boycott of the NFL for, in particular, uh, the league's um, attempt to stop players from expressing political views on the field, like by kneeling during the national anthem. And then uh, in the tech area, we've seen companies who uh, work with ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, in a variety of ways, you know, being targeted. So companies who are sharing data with ICE, also Greyhound you know, bus lines was targeted because they allowed ICE agents to board their buses. So we're seeing a lot of activity around that. Short list, but I just wanted to pick a few to help frame the context for all these things. Uh, certifications, um, the Leaping Bunny, the Leaping Bunny is sort of leaping off the page here, but uh, this is a certification mark that appears on products that, uh, sorry, it's actually a certification of companies and brands uh, whose products are not tested on animals. And uh, over 1,000 brands are certified and have this mark on them. Then we have buying guides, a few examples of those. Um, privacy not included is uh, one that Mozilla launched a few years ago. Uh, I don't. I have some uh, some issues with the ratings in their guide. Um, they're primarily rating products based on their ability to spy on you or not spy on you. Um, all of these products have proprietary software on them, and almost all of them are internet connected, and almost all of them receive updates. So I'm not real sure how you definitively say that these products don't spy on you. They all have the potential to spy on you, and we know in particular Sony 
uh, rather famously pushed out an update that took away really important freedoms from uh, PlayStation users. They changed what the PlayStation was capable of after they had bought it. So I am a little bit skeptical of the methodology here, but it's an example of a buying guide. Um, shows some products in a positive way that you should buy, shows some in a negative way that you shouldn't buy. EFF um, published a buying guide this last holiday season, which was focused exclusively on products you should not buy. Uh, and it, uh, they say, first sentence, EFF doesn't endorse products, but they wanted to call attention to some dangers of uh, popular products during the holidays. Those are both sort of December holiday shopping oriented ones, so I thought I would pull out an Easter one, which I found. The Easter chocolate buying guide, which rates uh, different sellers of chocolate on their uh, treatment of workers, their treatment of the environment, uh, in particular the cocoa that they buy. And again with the bunnies, I don't know, I guess that's the theme too. Uh, the FSF engages in uh, all three of these activities as well. We have. Uh, we boycott all proprietary software. Ultimately, we say that people should not buy any proprietary software or use any proprietary software, but we do you know, break that down into some specific approaches. We have our Defected by Design campaign, which focuses on um, opposing products that use digital restrictions management or DRM. Uh, Upgrade from Windows is just our ongoing campaign against Windows specifically. We try to bring some attention to it every time there's a new version of Windows that comes out. Delete Facebook, we're on that bandwagon. Uh, cancel Netflix. Netflix has DRM. So as part of these boycotts, we have uh, tried to have protests at the places where people are going to buy things that are problematic, like DRM encumbered products. We've done a lot of these under our, the rubric of our Defective by Design campaign. Uh, this photo is outside the Cambridge Side Galleria in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, that is me speaking with the police who were called by Apple in advance to um, give them a heads up that we were going to be protesting in the Apple store. Uh, I don't know what Apple thought the police were going to do. So we were outside the mall before we went in. We were putting on some costumes and getting ready. And the police came over and uh, asked me what we were doing. Uh, actually, no, that the reason I knew they knew what we were doing is because they came up and said, you guys are the DRM protesters. I'm like, yes, that's us. And the cop said, well, I know what DRM is. Oh, good. So that's the stuff that won't let me copy my son's music. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but that wasn't even the, my favorite part of the conversation. My favorite part of the conversation was when I said, do you want us to arrest one of you? <laughs> uh, no, but thank you for the offer. It's very nice. it's like, I just wanted to be honest. Sometimes groups like to have someone get arrested and get uh, good pictures. So I had only lived in Boston for a couple years at this point, and I thought, man, the Cambridge police are a lot cooler than the police were. Thank you. Uh, they made me cut the ponytail off when I became executive director. But that was not. Uh, we also protested in Times Square at the launch of uh, Windows Vista. Um, this was January. It was cold. Uh, these little ropes, that is what they call a free speech zone. So it's not just Iraqi war protesters who yeah. get put in free speech zones. It is yeah. uh, Windows Vista protesters. <laughs> and the interaction with the police here was not so positive. We were, um, the Windows event was occurring in the, what was at the time called the Nokia Theater right in Times Square. I think it's maybe called something else now. And uh, we were just walking around in these bright yellow suits. We were handing out CDs, which was amazing because uh, people thought we were handing out free copies of Vista. Because <laughs> uh, we were handing them to the line of people that was waiting to go into the Windows Vista launch event. We were actually handing out copies of GNU Linux, of course. Uh, so I, I really wish we had some feedback about what happened when they went home and uh, put that CD on their computers. Uh, but after we were doing that for a while, the police came over and said, you guys have to go over here. And over here was a space between two tour buses parked along the side. So, you know, two buses and we're in between. So you could only see us from one side. And the cop said, is there a problem? I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we're doing a protest. Nobody can see us. But you don't have a lot of choice. Um, we're not out to get arrested, actually. I would prefer to have a long and fruitful career. And they can just, they can just do that arbitrarily, it's just to find a space for you? Yeah, um, you know, of course all these things can kind of be challenged after the fact. Yeah. 
but in the moment, you know, what are you, what are you really going to do? Uh, you take down somebody's badge number, and if you feel it was really egregious, you try to follow up after the fact. There's also, um, you know, there's other rules we learned through this, like you can't actually have picket signs in, uh, I think in New York City, but definitely not in Times Square. You can't have uh, wood sticks, because those are a danger. Um, and uh, also, in a different protest in Boston, we learned that um, many, you know, lots of sidewalks and public spaces are actually privately, what you would think is a public space, is actually privately owned. Uh, so sidewalks, most sidewalks around the FSF office in downtown Boston are privately owned which we learned while we were doing a protest outside of a movie theater in downtown Boston, walking down on the public sidewalk, and the police came over and said, you have to go to the other side of the street to the park, which is actually public. So, yeah, free speech. Yeah. Happens to veterans all the time, and uh, a good resource is veteransforpeace.org. Okay. And uh, protesting. Yeah, veteransforpeace.org, it's great. Um, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for to see what other people have experienced and trying to do these things. I'm, I'm no expert, you know, and this really, I have my experiences that I'm sharing here, but uh, I'm not up on, on all of the, the tactics and techniques. We've just um, tried to bring those things into the organization as we learn them and, and try to share back a little bit. Yeah, I just like that picture. Uh, Cancel Netflix has been strictly an online action, although uh, back when Netflix used to send actual DVDs through the mail, um, we did uh, have uh, people, we provided a little note um, that people could print out, a you know, bunch of them on a sheet, cut them up, and put them back in the Netflix envelope when they were returning the DVD that said, you know, uh, please drop DRM on the online streaming service. Uh, we also visited the Microsoft store in the mall in Boston. Um, this is one of my uh, former colleagues in a, wearing a stuffed Gnu head, standing outside of the Microsoft store, handing out some of the giving guide flyers that I mentioned. Um, also, one of the local Boston area volunteers standing next to him. Uh, free speech does not exist in shopping malls, so uh, all of these things that we've done have lasted a very short amount of time basically get in, you hand out some things, security asks you to leave, and you leave, <laughs> uh, with one exception. Um, when we've done the protest at the Apple stores, I couldn't find a picture of this one, we, uh, when Apple gave the police the heads up in advance, they had also alerted their own staff so that when they had been instructed to not bother us, so all we had to do was get really quickly from the entrance to the mall to the Apple store. Uh, and so we went to the restroom, which was across from the Apple store, and then just ran across with the costumes on the mall hallway, and the security guards were like, eh, but then we were in the Apple store, and uh, Apple had told the mall security not to try to kick us out of the store itself. And Apple let us you know, walk around and take pictures and <laughs> hand things out to people in the store. But generally, uh, a lot of the protests, this was a nationwide thing. I was involved in the Boston one, but we also coordinated them around other places. And a lot of the protests never actually made it to the Apple store because the mall security intercepted them in the parking lot. You know, the parking lot is private property, so you can't really get you know, close to, which is a challenge with this work, you can't get to the people that you're trying to reach because that's all controlled by a corporation that does not share your interest. Um, when I said at the beginning that I've heard you know, the just don't buy it thing from people over the years, this uh, protest at the Boylston Apple store in Boston when it opened was one of the main times that I'll always remember because uh, we were, people were lined up waiting to get into the Apple store for the first time and we were outside with our signs and somebody said, don't you have anything better to do? I was like, you're waiting in a three block long <laughs> line to get into the Apple store. Um, and also Apple security there tried to tell us that we couldn't be on the sidewalk that was a public sidewalk which I also thought was very ironic because Apple, you know, they, they intentionally cultivate these big launch situations, which in cities like Boston just wrecks the public uh, infrastructure for that period of time. You know, there's people, police are out. I don't think Apple, at least I remember reading for this one, Apple did not pay the police extra, right? The police just have to do their duty to help keep uh, public order and nobody compensates them for that. So Apple's and other companies, they're not alone in this, but 
you know, these things kind of abuse public resources and then they don't give back and then they're also trying to kick the public out of the public resource at the same time. All kind of ugly. So that's kind of the you know boycott, critical oriented things that, that some of the highlights from that work. But we also have our uh, certification program for Respect Your Freedom, uh, which is where we try to positively encourage purchase of products that respect users, meet certain standards, kind of our equivalent of the Leaping Bunny or the Windows certified logo. Uh, so this is a mark that you can only display on your product if you meet the standards and you've been evaluated by the Free Software Foundation. Uh, this is an older product from uh, Think Penguin, but it's, uh, I have it in here because it's an example of what we're after here, which is getting that mark printed you know, right on the product next to the other certifications. Um, as an indication for people who may not really understand very much about how the technology works inside or how the software works inside, something, a clear sign they can look for for a product they can trust and a company they want to support. We also do publish an annual giving guide at fsf.org slash giving guide. Um, a lot of what it does these days is highlight some of those interesting products that have been certified, but we also bring in some other things and, and include a don't buy section as well it's kind of contrast, you know, don't buy uh, uh, the Alexa, you know, don't buy uh, various Microsoft or Apple laptops, buy RYF certified laptops instead. Uh, and then we also try to organize and encourage people, something that you all can participate in in the next holiday uh, shopping season, uh, what we call giving guide giveaways, which are basically just showing up in shopping areas and handing out, you know, physically handing out the copies of the giving guide or a print version of it. It's a little bit of a subset that then points people to the full version. And that's, uh, we've had some success with that. You know, it's a, we I think it's important that when we think of ourselves as activists, we don't stay too focused on just online activism and information distribution. We actually have to you know, be out there talking to people if we want people to take this issue seriously. We publish a guide to DRM free living on defectedbydesign.org where we collect just uh, artists who publish DRM-free books, DRM-free music, you know, with the idea being that we want to protest DRM and we also want to acknowledge that there are artists out there who are you know, making a living and do feel right about distributing their work without DRM on it. And that's uh, some of the, a lot of this doesn't cost any money at all, so it's not exactly a buying guide, but it's a resource that helps you live a DRM-free life by making different kinds of choices. Uh, hnode.org. As a hardware compatibility database, which in effect functions as a kind of buying guide. It's uh, not a, it's separate from our certification program uh, because our certification program focuses on specific retailers selling specific products. Uh, HNode has a lot of information about components. So if you're looking for video cards that are supported by free software or you know, uh, wireless adapters that are supported by free software, you can check HNode. Uh, and it's also a place you can contribute to because HNO collects information that's updated, uploaded by users who confirm that this hardware works on their free software system. So now uh, we want to talk about how effective these things are, if at all. Um, so does the do not buy this, you know, does the boycott approach actually work? Well, uh, it's pretty, a lot of people say no. Um, at least not at directly causing change. So, you know, this uh, professor at the Wharton School says very few boycotts lead to change. Uh, most boycotts lack the sustained effort. People lose interest, stop paying attention. Uh, in practice, they achieve the more modest goal of attracting media attention. You can see some assumptions in there, like sort of saying that boy part one reason boycotts fail is because they fail to, to keep people interested and active. So it's not something that's inherently a problem with the technique. It's just uh, an observation about uh, the way they've typically been executed. So that's one thing to keep in mind, but we know for sure that they don't work if you don't tell anybody about them. So you know, like this highlights that uh, the need to tell people about them because it highlights what happens when you don't keep a sustained effort. It also highlights the fact that one thing that they do achieve is media attention for the issue. And so that's a you know, response to the just don't buy it thing. Is, the benefit comes out of explaining to people why nobody should buy these things. Uh, and related to media attention, we our Bad Vista campaign, for example, was for a while on the first page of search results for Windows Vista. And so when you think about media attention, 
it's not just you know getting out of the New York Times, Seattle Times, getting out on, on TV. It's also that uh, you know, SEO aspect of making sure that when someone who doesn't know, uh, who has some questions, let's say about Windows Vista, and they do a search, you want to make sure that the information that points out the dangers and the problems with it pops up. And so any campaign which helps you get links and, and attention will help make sure that your information is climbs the, the algorithm uh, in order to actually reach people. Uh, and like I mentioned, the first uh, those Apple Store protests did seem to work because we know they got Apple's attention. And, and anytime you are, uh, any anytime you know that your target is paying attention to you and watching what you're doing and spending at least some resources on keeping up with that, that's some kind of success, right? If they're, if they're just ignoring you, then uh, that maybe they're ignoring you as a specific tactic, but uh, they can also be ignoring you because they know that you're not being effective. So I take that as a positive sign of some success. And we do, uh, even in this article where this quote came from the LA Times, uh, concedes that the Montgomery bus boycott is widely viewed as having been successful, helping to spur an important part of the civil rights movement. Um, the HP2 boycott was arguably successful since it was repealed. But um, that one, you know, uh, more in-depth analysis of these things has to look at kind of the agents who are involved here. We're talking about, on one hand, about boycotts of, uh, that are directed at individual consumers. You know, don't buy a, an iPhone. HP2, the people who were um, driving part of the boycott were very large organizations like the NCAA. You know, College Athletics Association, um, even other governments in the US were forbidding their employees from traveling to North Carolina. So boycotts aren't necessarily just you, know, you going to the store and, buying, and not buying something. It's also much larger organizations getting involved in these things. And so it might be interesting to look at which successful ones were truly driven by individual um, purchasing choices. Less successful ones, uh, I'm putting for now the NFL uh, in this category. The NFL's ratings have been dropping, but they were also dropping before any of the political controversy started. Uh, but when you talk about media attention, um, there certainly was a lot of media attention around the issue in general. Uh, but as far as I know, nothing has actually changed you know, in, the, in the league about policies towards player protests. They've sort of developed some workarounds, like just don't put it on TV. Uh, and the owners sort of circled their wagons, so it doesn't seem to have affected change so far. Uh, companies who work with ICE, again, a lot of media attention, uh, but as far as I know, not a lot of policy change, if any. And this is a kind of a, the more I was thinking about this one, it's very strange. You're trying to, I mean, I'm not criticizing it, or, you know, but it, the idea that we're, in, we're trying to influence government behavior by leaning on corporations, <laughs> it kind of throws my head for a loop. Really, like what it's when we're talking about, uh, we're going to get into talking about like a little bit of the risk and over focusing on consumer activism, and this is clearly an issue for our government and our democracy. You know, to the extent that it's an issue, it's because uh, people think that government officials are behaving poorly, and they shouldn't do that, right? Uh, so it's very interesting to me to think about the the, the idea that we focus on companies to get them to change their be to get them to stand up to the government when it's the you know, it's individuals who have the vote and supposedly other alternatives. Probably not a great statement about the state of our democracy. So what about the, the positive ones, you know, the certifications and the buying guides? Uh, anyway, on one hand, this, this seems very straightforward, right? Like if you, you want people to, as a, to have businesses where they sell uh, products that you think are ethical or ethically made, well, you have to have people to buy them, right? And if you want people to buy them, you have to inform people which product, uh, products those are. So it makes a lot of, uh, intu makes a lot of intuitive sense. But uh, I've started to read and people have some interesting arguments about these things being somewhat limited because they can end up just creating niche markets that are large enough to accommodate the, the demands. You know, they satisfy, like, you know, I'm happy to be vegan. I've been vegan for a long time, and I've seen the massive increase in vegan labeled products over the years. But that might, you know, kind of hit a, a hit a ceiling where it's satisfied the demand, and it doesn't, at that point, it sort of stops driving any kind of broader social change. It's just becomes an option, right? And it's a better option. It's an easier option. 
but it's still just an option. And, and how does that fit into the FSF's mission of where we're trying to get all software to be free software and not just have a great, large free software option? Uh, another really interesting challenge with these is uh, companies get bought. And uh, thinking about, this can really uh, give you a headache if you start thinking about the impact of this on consumer activism. Uh, you know, I, being vegan soy milk is something that I have bought for many years and uh, silk soy milk was long ago purchased by a very large dairy company, right? And uh, as far as I know, all of the companies making uh, soy milk or non-dairy milks in the mass market are actually owned by dairy companies. Mm -hmm. So some of them are wholly owned subsidiaries that really are still their own kind of thing. Some of them, uh, but how does that, what does that mean, right? And we see this a bit in the free software world too. Um, we could see it if RYF continues to be successful. What does it mean if a, a company who makes mostly proprietary software and products has you know, some division that makes uh, respects to freedom products? You know, to what extent does that influence our decision about how much focus to put on this? Uh, we do have some evidence with RYF, just to give an example of things that we look at to judge success. Uh, we have 39 devices certified so far, nine of those in 2019, and we have around 30 pending applications. So we're catching up on the applications. Actually, we've, we've been the bottleneck on this, which is both good news and bad news. Oh, geez. Um, because we want it to be successful, so we don't want companies who are applying for certification to have to hang around and wait on us. Uh, we do expect to hopefully double the number of certified products compared to 2018 this year. We're putting a lot of, putting more resources into it, have a new website coming out for the program that's, if you look at it now, I, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a flat list of all the certified products. Um, we're gonna turn that into a site where users and, and people looking to buy things actually go and, and click around and find different categories of products and see ones that are certified and click through those, uh, click through that to buy them, be a much better experience, which I think will help the program a lot. But you know, we had to get through that first stage of building the interest in the program in order to make that possible. And then we also need to be doing a lot of work on gathering information about the economic impacts uh, of the program. You know, we need some of the businesses who have certified products to share information with us about how that's affected their sales. We had a very frustrating experience. I mean, not, it was uh, frustrating, disappointing, I should say, because we were applying for a grant to help fund the Respect Your Freedom certification program. And we got pretty far in the process and we had a committee of people that was interested. The grant was basically provides you with expert help as a nonprofit to advance one of your programs and the experts that they had assigned to evaluate our application were people who had been involved in the Good Housekeeping certification program, who had been involved in the, um, one of the electrical certifications. And so they seemed really interested, but the question that we couldn't answer for them was, how do we know, what's the size of the potential market here? And that was ultimately why they decided that they, you know, that we weren't a great candidate for them to help right now. So we have to do some work there. I was disappointed because, well, that's what we need you guys for, right? Like, we need your help in uh, doing those kind of surveys and that kind of market research in order to figure that out. Uh, but economic impact, we also want to measure when it comes to boycotts, um, but like we said, you know, boycotts, one of the main things about them is they drive news coverage, and that news coverage, besides bringing more attention to the issue, it mobilizes and energizes people, energizes people, gets them into the movement where they then may join us in other kinds of actions, right, like uh, putting pressure on elected officials or, um, you know, doing advocacy in their local school system. So it can be a way to get people involved and excited, and then they go on to also help with other kinds of activities besides just these. Um, so we want to measure news coverage as a sign of uh, impact or not. We want to measure participation. How many people do we have attending those protests? Um, how many people participate in any online type action that we do? We want to measure the public opinion on the issues that we're trying to influence, uh, something that we haven't historically done and we need to figure out a way to start doing on a, a semi-regular basis. Everybody loves surveys now, right? So then, there's some potential here, but like I said, I want to talk about what focus on consumer choice doesn't address. 
one of the most important aspects of this for our world is that the government or governments around the world, and talk about the US as an example, provide certain kinds of advantages to proprietary software. And they it essentially makes it not a level playing field. And that doesn't mean that a, a boycott or a other consumer focused tool can't work, but it means that its job is much harder. And it also means that it can't necessarily fully solve the problem by itself. And one of the main examples of this that I point to is DRM. Uh, itself. So if you think about what DRM is, DRM is a, a technical measure that prevents you from doing certain things, usually copying. If you break that, then under the DMCA and the US and in similar laws uh, in other parts of the world, you are, you, you've done something criminal. Well, what happens when you do something criminal, right? The state devotes resources to um, enforcing that law against you. They won't necessarily do it unless the company who you know, owns the DRM product uh, notifies them and says that they want to pursue it. But ultimately, the state's resources do get brought to this. And so when people are telling us, well, if you don't like iPhones, just don't buy them, well, it's more than that. It's the, the, the government that we pay money to and are a part of actually subsidizes these companies who use DRM, essentially artificially props up their business model, right? Apple gets uh, business because you can't get software for the iPhone from anybody but Apple. So, and you can't change that because of DRM. So DRM becomes a subsidy that props up their business model and that's something that makes the playing field not level and arguably may not be, may be very difficult to impact through just uh, a boycott. What you end up with is a situation where people say, well, your free phone is not as nice as the iPhone. Well, part of the reason the free phone is not as nice as the iPhone is because the iPhone has been given a giant advantage that they shouldn't have. You can also look at uh, cases like Amazon's uh, recent, you know, the whole fiasco about uh, where they're going to open their new office and all of the tax breaks and other things that were done by governments to court Amazon and try to bring them to their communities. And, you know, that, that's a complicated issue because people need jobs. And especially as activists, we always have to be, you know, we have to be empathetic about why people are making the choices that they're making and don't disregard other aspects of any given situation. But it also, we do need to make the point that this is a company that's doing arguably great harm to the world with devices like, you know, Alexa and the, uh, their proprietary tablets and uh, DRM ebooks and Kindles. Um, and why, is, why are governments giving them incentives? To, that they you know, won't give to another company in order to um, invite them to look at their office there. It's another example of something that's not directly related to our decision to buy or not buy an Amazon product. Likewise, collusion and monopolies, you know, just classic things that skew the market. Um, and I put ubiquity and education on this list because I think that it's a real challenge when proprietary software has a, a foothold in schools already, they sort of get to define and frame the issue for people, like what is a good product, what is good software, and that makes it very difficult for us to come in later and try to undo, you know, it's what's, what's good or not, what somebody wants to buy or not, depends a lot on their expectations about what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to do it. And when those expectations are already set in a, at an early age, that makes the consumer-focused approaches very difficult. And then when it comes to boycott specifically, you know, there's no shortage of adages about the dangers of being negative and campaigning. Never wrestle with a pig, you both get dirty and the pig likes it. You know, he slings mud, loses ground. It's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. I also think uh, there are some additional risks with focusing too much on consumer choice. One of the most important ones for me is that it can, if you're not careful, shift blame away from the producers of the products to begin with. So you have to be careful when you're talking about the power that people have as individuals to buy or not buy something and to try to affect change that way. Uh, you, you want people to acknowledge their agency and their power in that way, but you also don't want to make it seem like it's their fault that this product exists, right? Like the, the product uh, and this has been an issue that I've read a lot about in the environmental movement that, you know, we, we, you uh, 
can end up putting too much focus on individual consumption habits in the environmental context and therefore shifting focus away from the, the environmental impact of much larger entities. Like we encourage people to save water, like don't leave the water running while you're brushing your teeth. Um, and yet there's companies that are running fountains like 24 hours a day that waste all kinds of water. It's, you, know, you have to be careful not to shift blame away from uh, places or accountability you know, away from places where it needs to be kept. Uh, there's also a real danger, um, I'm sure there's a better way to put this, but if you are really you know, uh, strongly extolling a boycott, and trying to get other people to join you, if you do anything that is arguably inconsistent with that, well, now you're a hypocrite and you know, people won't listen to you anymore. So as a, you know, as a vegan, for me, I encounter this, like we say you're vegan, but you have a leather belt on. Well, I guess you know, veganism is out, right? Well, it's, more, it's a little more complicated than that, we know. And we can address that argument, but the more focus you put on, you absolutely must not buy these products, the more you can set yourself up for um, accusations of hypocrisy and people may be tuning out because of that. We encounter this in free software all the time, right? How many people ask RMS at every speech he gives, like, you know, uh, how do you get money out of the bank? Right? Do you use an ATM machine? And yes, everybody interacts with and uses proprietary software um, in, in countries like the United States, it's just not, it's not literally not possible unless you're not you know, on the grid at all. And then uh, extrinsic values, um, we may need to worry you know, about basic consumer values and there's been some things written in the environmental movement about um, making it seem like a status thing to buy environmentally positive products you you might accidentally be reinforcing sort of uh, certain kinds of capitalist consumerist ideologies that then feed back into other kinds of unexpected destructive habits that's uh, an interesting thing to think about and kind of what you know rms is talking about in this quote about the problem with the term consumer in general you know he says makes one point first that when we're talking about programs, we shouldn't talk about consuming them because it leads to thinking of them as property to begin with. Programs aren't something that gets consumed, right? And then also describing users of software as consumers limits our framing to choosing between different products in a market, when in reality with free software, you can mod the idea is you can modify the software yourself or ask someone to modify it for you. So it's really encouraging a view of software, which is not just a product that you buy and then you it's much more, it's actually something that you can work with yourself. So that is a, a danger to avoid. So just to wrap up, uh, where do we go from here? Um, you know, I think we do need to keep, my, my conclusion so far is we do, we do need to keep these things up. They are valuable. They're not, they're not uh, backfiring, right? They're producing some benefit. We need to keep them up, but we need to be, we need to make sure that we're not just focusing on consumer uh, approaches. We need to also still be working on you know, policy changes and working on undoing those kind of social advantages that uh, our governments give to proprietary software. I encourage everybody to do their best with purchasing. You know, pay attention to the, the certification list that we publish. Pay attention to the buying guides that other um, groups in technology, EFF and Mozilla publish. Um, and do your best to try to support those things. I think that you know, we know for sure, for example, in the case of the certification program, if nobody is buying Think Penguin certified products or nobody is buying Technoethicals certified products or Minifreeze, uh, then what do we expect to happen, right? <laughs> like they're not gonna be there. Uh, so we do need to keep supporting them along with other things. Just a couple efforts that you can join immediately. We have uh, hnode.org, like I said, is a, a database of contributing, free so of, uh, contributing information about hardware that works with free software. Um, it's a step towards addressing this issue of like, I have to buy a new computer, I really want to get something that works with GNU Linux, uh, what do I do? Um, you can help out with that, you can help build the DRM free guide. Those are ways, that are very easy to, things you can make uh, small contributions to without too much investment. Um, and I think we need to measure more, you know, it's clear, it's a lot, I'm doing a lot of hand waving about the effectiveness of things, we need to actually figure out ways to measure the effectiveness of some of these different approaches in the free software context. I want to do some more research about their effectiveness and you know, historical context and other movements in general. And please support the FSF. So thank you. Um, I kind of went almost to time, but uh, I'm happy to hang out and if people have some questions or comments or advice. I'd love to hear it.
freedom of code. Yeah. Now, arguably, with all the online services we are using, the code has become relatively less important compared to the data, the tracking, and all of that. Where, in going forward, where do you see where the line is between what the FDF does and what you know the rest of the world does? Are you going to exp because you've become a lot of DRM today, uh, yeah. unusually much? I think. Yeah. Uh, are you expanding? You're staying there in terms of scope? What you're trying to do, or how do you see this going? Yeah, so uh, to try and just paraphrase the question, it's uh, what, do we, what do we need to do or what are we going to do in order to address the fact that uh, a lot of computing and a lot of uh, the, the harms of society that we're concerned about are now happening as a result of things that are done over the network and, and not just on people code running on people's local computers. Uh, and I did talk a lot about DRM today, uh, and that's a, an example of where things are actually changing a lot and we really need to adjust our approach because... Um, I think that uh, kids these days a lot don't even know what DRM is because everything is streamed and they don't own uh, music files. They don't go through the pain that a lot of us had to go through of trying to move a music file from one place to another and losing it in the process. Um, so DRM is a huge problem on streaming and we need to address that, but the, address, the way to address that is different than what we've been doing. When it comes to networks, yeah, uh, we need to... So, what we've been doing so far is trying to explain how our values still apply. Um, one way is that a lot of these services do still involve you running software locally as part of that. So the JavaScript that you run um, whenever you interact with Google Docs or Facebook or Twitter is non-free software that's running on your own computer. And that's a key component to the services, and that's just the same old problem. It's software needs to be free, and that software has been shown to do really bad things to people um, when it's proprietary, but that's not the whole picture. We also have been urging people to resist anything that involves essentially them giving up something that they used to do on a computer that they had control over to a service. So that's not a free software issue in the sense that even if the server operator gives you the source code for the software that's running on the server, you can't log into the server and modify it. Facebook could publish all their source code tomorrow and it would not solve all the problems of Facebook because you can't change what Facebook is doing. Um, but that fundamental principle of don't give up your freedom, you should care about your freedom, you should care about a culture of code produced in freedom and computing produced in freedom and offloading your work to a remote server is, is in opposition to that. But we have to figure out ways to communicate that better. And we had a, a summit at the FSF uh, some years ago called the Frank, they published something called the Franklin Street Statement, which I think still is one of the best elucidations of what is an ethical what is an ethical network service look like and it, it has more than just they publish their source code although that's part of it but it's also you know they allow you to get your data uh, and so on so it's a really fair question um, and you know I did put up there delete Facebook and some of we are involved in campaigns to try to get people off of some of the specific services that are problematic yeah um, I very much believe in Your freedom in every single way, but then maybe there's these other products that you know they're they're getting there, they're on their way. Yeah. Um, they're completely ignored, and I don't know. I mean, I don't believe that there's such a thing as black and white, good and evil. It's so simple to terms. Um, do you not think it would be valuable? Like it would increase engagement, I'm sure, for more parties um, to have. I don't know. Like, Power supplies have like 80 plus bronze, silver, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, whatever. <coughs> yeah, so the, the question is, are our approaches potentially too binary? Should we consider more granular uh, evaluations? Um, I, think, I think yes and no. I think uh, so the, the, even the ROAF program, we actually get criticized for it not being strict enough um, because it, it does allow exceptions for, for example, laptops that are certified do still have proprietary firmware on the hard drive because there are no hard drives that don't have proprietary firmware anymore. There's, there's still exceptions and they're very defined and contained and we expect them to change over time as new technology develops, but they're there. So we do get criticized them for the other direction as well. Uh, but I, I think that with RYF it may be more complicated. We want it to be a very simple buy this product, 
or don't buy this product, it's a little bit difficult to say this product that we think is, this thing that we think is unethical, which is proprietary software, uh, well, this only has like a B minus level of proprietary stuff. It's like, it, if it's unethical, it's very hard to grade that way. But I think in the broader picture, the FSF can do a lot better at okay. celebrating partial, at celebrating progress. And that's something that I am very interested in doing. Let me give you an example of, in, um, in my local supermarket, mm -hmm. there's the egg section. Yeah. And so um, in the egg section, there's a label next to each of the eggs, and it goes red, orange, green. Um, and so you've got your, it's not exactly more than that, but it's, so you've got your, your caged, um, like, like your factory farm awfulness. Then you have your free run, where they let them out every once in a while. Uh, your free range, where they can run around, and then your organic, which is supposed to be the greenest one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, this seems like it's good for getting like, companies to actually pay attention, which at the end of the day, if, if no companies pay attention and there are no cell phones available that are free or no any product that's available that are free, yeah. people are going to buy the non-free one because who cares? You know, it's like at some point yeah. you have the technology available and you want to use it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's a fair point, and it's, not, it's something, I'm not dismissing it, it's something that we've talked about quite a bit, um, even in the context of RYF. Uh, just some, you know, a, a kind of counterexample is that the, the, the person who wrote, um, started the Libreboot project for free boot firmware for laptops, did so in order to meet the RYF criteria. Um, and when we established this criteria, there, were, there was no laptop that could possibly meet it because of the boot firmware and the BIOS, you know, first of all. And it was the creation of those standards that led to that being done. So, and, and when you look at, like, you know, I use the example of the animal testing certification, a certification that says, well, it's, it's not tested on very many animals, <laughs> is like, you know, that, it's not persuasive. Um, but, I, 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 so these are things we think about, but it's, we, it's something we need to pay attention to and evaluate. And I think we need to look at some more examples. If you want to keep our pure, I mean, why not like a second certification that then is graded that isn't? You know, it's not like it respects your freedom to yeah. certify that, but it's like, this is better. You know, well, in a sense, so we that. do that. You know, we do that on H node that says, like, this hardware is compatible mm -hmm. with free software. We do that on the giving guide. For example, we have uh, an entry for replicant phones that technoethical sells on the giving guide. Those aren't certified, but they're a lot better than a typical Android phone. So, um, so we do that in certain ways. But, so, so there's a difference in those years. Yeah, good. I mean, it's a, what I'm saying is I think you have a valid point and it's something we need to pay attention to. Um, but on the counter side, it's like high standards help drive change. Um, and also for certain kinds of arguments, grading doesn't make as much sense as it might initially seem to. Uh, but I really want to focus on people who are making steps towards free software. I want to be able to celebrate those even when they're not all the way there. I think there's, we need to look for other ways we can do that even if it's not the certification program. Uh, my quality. Yeah, kind of on that your last point there. Thank you for uh, reminding us none of us are perfect and we can't always uh, avoid proprietary software. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are for those of us from time to time or full time, like yourself, mm -hmm. are seen as leaders uh, in the free software movement, or maybe we're even just giving a talk at a conference. Um, and obviously, we some people uh, are more successful at, at sticking to free software than others. Um, and on the on some extremes, sometimes you have people who are uh, criticized for even using their competitors' pro pro products on stage. Yeah, right. um, but what do you see your role as a leader in using those opportunities where you're kind of stuck for some reason to kind of educate? How, how much should we integrate that into our normal talks? Um, is this a, a, almost a full-time job we should take on You know, when there are problems? Uh, how, to what extent do you think people, when they are in leadership roles, should try to focus on that? It's a, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think it kind of ties into to what extent you know signaling is kind of an important part of, of social change and, and, and saying if we fail to do enough to show that you can use free software and can use you know free software friendly products if we're not doing it then who's who's going to do it um, so I, at least from my personal approach to it it's just I, I make it I try to I try to try hard right that's the thing and be honest about I think the, the thing that can happen, you wanna accept the imperfection, but you don't wanna 
ignore it, right? And so I, we just try to keep a, you know, a running thing like, what am I doing about this? What is my plan? And that's what we're doing at the FSF, for example, with JavaScript. It's like, what is our plan to never have to run proprietary JavaScript, which is ubiquitous, right? You can't do banking. You can't, you can't uh, do, you can't file comments to the federal government through regulations.gov. You can't do like, you can't apply for a job. You can't do much of anything without running proprietary JavaScript. So, you know, don't forget about those things, right? Um, and in group settings, I think it's really important to still raise the question. So, you know, I ride in Ubers and Lyfts that other people call, but I try, I could be like, offer, you know, I can call a taxi or, you know, I can look for some other way to try to do what we're doing. If, if we don't say it in those situations, then like who, the worst thing that happens is that nobody says it and then we're sort of going backwards again. I think I better, there's a lot of people standing outside and I don't know if there's another talk in here at 45 after, but yeah, okay. Thank you all very much. Uh, the FSF booth is open and please stop by.